So this is my uh, OSI 400 CPU board in what I believe is its final build configuration. Uh, we've talked about it on and off previously. It uses a MOS 6501 processor, uh, date code of 34th week of 1975. It sits over here. The MOS 6530-004 sits over here. And sorry, there's enough glare on the gold top that you really can't read it. Uh, I struggled to get a decent picture of this where you could see detail and didn't have glare. And this was about the best I could come up with. This is my third attempt, actually, at getting a description of the hardware done in an acceptable format because the video has just been so bad. So anyhow, as you see here, the board is in its final configuration. So let's talk a little bit how the, what the, you know, how the board's configured and how it works. There's a reset switch up here, obviously. All it does is it's a single pull, single throw. It pulls the reset pin low. That resets the processor and the, the TIM chip, the, the, you know, the riot chip over here. Uh, because it's not debounced, sometimes it doesn't reset cleanly. Most of the time it does. There's a 74123 sitting here. It's a dual one shot. It's got uh, 100 picofarad cap here with an 11k ohm resistor to set one of the one shots. And down here is another 100 picofarad resistor and two 22k ohm resistors. That because of this link, I have connected in parallel to get 11k. And so basically, each one of the one shots fires for about the same amount of time. Uh, this is set up in a configuration where it creates a two-phase non-overlapping clock. The outputs of this go to the 7407 here, an open collector driver uh, that has a 1K pull-up resistor on both phase 0 and phase 1. You see the resistors here. So the outputs from him are driving the inputs on the drivers here, and then the outputs here become phase 0 and phase 1, and they connect to the phase clocks on the CPU. Uh, this pulls up very nearly to the 5-volt rail, very close, and pulls well to ground. And, and that really solid clock is really required for the 6501 and the 6800, which could also pin out wise, electrically wise, the socket to work correctly. Uh, and that's the reason this design is the way it is, is the dual one shot to produce the non-overlapping two-phase clock. And then the drivers here to really drive hard uh, that two-phase clock. Uh, both of these devices are in, are just soldered directly to the board. There was no reason to socket them. They're just Jelly Bean TTL. You can see that I use later date code stuff. I just grabbed out of my, my box. I wasn't worried about date code specific TTL. Uh, most of this is 80s, uh, 83, you know, there's actually a 93 there. Just didn't worry about it. Uh, as we come across the board over here, we'll find the TIM chip. Uh, it is a 6530 Riot. The, the, the ROM in it has been mask programmed to implement the terminal uh, input manager, terminal, I think it's terminal input manager. It's a TIM, it's called the TIM. This is a simple software driven UR. It gives you the ability to look at memory, to modify memory, to modify system registers and to execute, you know, and to execute that code. Both it and the CPU sit in these 40 pin zero insertion force sockets. Uh, because I was impatient I actually put the TIM chip here into a 40 pin solder tail socket that I plugged into the board and when removing it from the socket I actually chipped the ceramic off right there and I'm really disappointed that because of my impatience I chipped some ceramic off the chip. These are in zero insertion force sockets, they'll normally be kept in anti-static foam just because they're super rare. They are what they are. Uh, down here we have eight 2102s. These are 1K by 1 static RAM, so there's a total of 1K of memory here. These sit in the 6501s or 6502s, page 0, page 1, page 2, and page 3 address space. Uh, see, it, it implements 1K of RAM, uh, you know, page 0 definitely given to the processor. There's 64 bytes of RAM, I believe, in the TIM chip. I own this riot chip. I'm not sure where that RAM is actually mapped. I guess I need to figure that out. Uh, power to the board it comes in on these two jumpers over here. Right now I have a, uh, an external switching power supply I'm using uh, that produces plus 5 and minus 9. That minus 9 is used on the other 400 CPU board I've got that's got a 1702 EEPROM here with the 65A monitor in it. Uh, when I power this board from it, I just clip the 9 volt rail out here someplace on, on, the, on the fiberglass and that way there's no chance of it shorting any place and just you know draw, you know, pull a plus 5 and VSS from it. There's a separate VSS and plus 5 uh, loop here you can connect onto. 
These were used for a logic probe and this one to use for an oscilloscope as I troubleshot an issue on the board. It took me a while to actually resolve. Uh, there's various TTL and drive, well, it's all TTL, various logic and, and drivers down here that ultimately produce the address decoding uh, that's used for the uh, RAMs here uh, and, you know, and the system in general. There's a couple of 7403 drivers here that ultimately are how this RAM gets onto and off of the bus. Uh, in my standalone CPU configuration, uh, these are socketed. They can be removed to fully isolate this from a backplane over here if you had a backplane on the system. Uh, there's some logic changes that have to be made on the board. There's a trace cut and, and some, some wiring configurations you do to get the TIM chip addressed correctly and enabled correctly. And that's part of the wire, the, you know, the wrap wires you see attached down here. If you remember on the 400 board, there's a lot of extra pads. Like there's two of them here. There's two that are used there. Unused pins on devices have these extra pads on them and are meant to do exactly what I've done here, wire into. In this case, I had to go directly to the IC pin because there was no external connection on that pin. But you'll notice, well, you really can't see it, but for most of the pins coming off the TIM, well, all the pins I've used here, there are these external connections. Uh, the data bus for the system comes off the CPU and you can see it kind of traveling underneath here and comes up to the TIM. Uh, there's a bunch of different 40-pin dips that can sit in this socket from Moss, and they had standardized uh, the data pins, so they were able, in this case, to hardwire the data pins across. Uh, this was built using the uh, OSI, I believe, App Note 1, that describes a part of how to get the TIM to work in the system. There was, was at least one error in the drawing in that PDF, and that is they have... VSS and VCC labeled backwards. VCC and VSS are hard-coded or hardwired on the board, so I didn't have to attach those, but the drawing has them backwards. If I would used a wrap socket, there's the potential I'd put power on the device backwards and maybe hurt it. Anna, do you want to get in your bed and quit clicking your toenails, please? Uh, like I said a minute ago, power comes in on these two connections here. There's a electrolytic cap here to provide some decoupling. There's a few green, you can kind of see them scattered around here, 0.1 microfarad decoupling caps as well. There's one up here. There's a few scattered on the board. Uh, when I first brought the board up, the TIM monitor would run for a few seconds to maybe 20 seconds and then just fail and spew garbage off the serial port. And because there was so much noise on the VSS and VCC rails, there's just a lot of noise on them that seem to be related to the clock here, I added additional decoupling. There's an electrolytic capacitor sitting here because there's a power of VSS and VCC rails here between the two ICs. I put the electrolytic right there. And on the back side of the board, I've added 0.1 microfarad decoupling caps for both of these devices. I've also added a 0.1 decoupling cap for the TIM chip down here. Those didn't resolve the issue. Uh, what eventually resolved the issue, I guess we can jump and talk to next, is this resistor right here. Uh, so these connections down the side here go to normally the OSI backplane. So the CPU card, the small amount of RAM, can plug into a backplane and you can have additional RAM and video cards and floppy controllers, etc. out there. Because I built this standalone, I needed to provide pull-ups on the board. Normally these pull-ups are provided on the backplane, but we're not using a backplane. So we've got all the address and some control signals down here, and I've added 470 ohms from each signal to this large copper pore here that is VCC, it's plus 5 volts, and that provides all the pull-ups for these signals. Uh, you may have noticed I didn't put the ICs in here. These are 1896s or 1895s, or a line driver, uh, kind of an old-school line driver that's used to drive some of the pins over here. Uh, I don't need those in this configuration because I don't have the back plane. I thought all three of these resistors dealt with pull-ups on here, but it turns out this resistor right here pulls up a signal that goes all the way across the board around to, I believe, the weight pin over here. I don't fully remember. You know, it comes to one of the pins on the processor, and the issue was without that pull-up resistor, with it floating, that pin would drift low enough that it would trigger that action in, in, in the CPU and the system would just run off the rails. Once I added resistors, you know, this resistor here, it fixed the system. 
it calls for 4.7k pull-ups here. The closest I had were these 5.1k's I've got in. And for this, this build, it's absolutely fine. 5.1 is plenty of pull-up for these. I've added the other two. These weren't necessarily, didn't need to be installed, but they're just there for completeness. Uh, other things to describe here. So on the TEM chip, these two wires you see coming out here are transmit and receive. So the serial data out, serial data in. Uh, it is TTL level, which means they're on 5 volts, serial data. Uh, it's configured at 300 baud, 8N1. Uh, there's a 6-pin header here. Only 3 pins are installed. There's VSS and transmit and receive. And how I'm currently talking to the board is I have a FTDI cable that uh, plugs into my Win 10 machine and appears as a serial port and the other end plugs down onto these three pins. And this brings the ground to make it common and the TTL level transmit and receive pins here so I can talk to the board. Uh, both of the transmit and receive signals go through inverters over here. It turned out both signals need to be inverted. Uh, so the outcoming comes out of the chip to an inverter to the connector here and the incoming comes to an inverter is inverted and back to the chip. There's actually an advantage in doing this in that these pins aren't directly tied to the TIM chip up here. If they were directly tied, it would be easier to get static directly to the chip and destroy the chip. Uh, static discharge at this point would come into the 7404 here. Uh, it's got, uh, I'm sure, input protection diodes on it that would hopefully clamp that to ground and not pass that, you know, that at that current surge, that voltage surge through onto the TEM chip. It adds a little more protection for these older chips on the board. Uh, the, this isn't quite as true for the CPU here. I believe some of these connections, maybe all these connections down here are directly to it. Eh, you know, it is what it is. I'm tending to keep the two, you know, rare chips here and, and uh, anti-static you know, of foam and only put them in the board when I'm going to use them. Uh, comment about the 300 baud here. According to the documentation, I should be able to operate the system at 110 or 300 baud. What happens on reset is the TIM monitor code starts listening on the serial in and expects to see a carriage return. And once it receives the carriage return, it looks at that set of bits and makes a decision how to configure the chip for baud rate. Uh, we'll see this demonstrated when we get into the live demo. Uh, if I set a 110 baud on the FTDI you know, interface, it never syncs up, it never captures. Uh, 300 baud captures really solidly every time. And I've tried 600 baud, that also doesn't capture. And I think the reason 110 doesn't capture correctly is I think the clock here is running a little faster than perhaps the TIM software expected and it's not able to build a big enough delay between each one of the bits it's looking for to, to accurately read 110 baud. So the 300 baud has been very solid. I'm very happy with how it performs. Uh, is there anything else here really on the board to talk to? Of course, the RAM chips are socketed. Uh, 2102s, you know, got a nice bank of eight of them here that work. They aren't necessarily high reliability. They're not low reliability either. Uh, you can see in the wiring here, the blue is pulling in, I believe, address bus signals, and I think all the white are potentially, most of them are control signals. Uh, I don't remember which control signals. Uh, one of the comments I'll make here is the drawing from OSI that App Note 1 have the clock pin for this chip coming off a signal down here that is phase 2 and V. Uh, VMA, valid memory address, yeah, VMA. So it was phase two and VMA, uh, pin 39 here on the connector. However, the pin labeled on the device is phase two, which is actually pin 42 down here. And I've taken the clock in to both of those locations and the system seems to work fine on either location. So I've just left it on phase two. So it is a slight wiring difference from what was called out in that, that application's note. Uh, there's three unused positions here. You can see there's a dip position there, there, and there's actually one sitting under here. And those are just for whatever you need to wire in, system mods, what you want to use. And I've used one of the three of those for this position here, just to get me this, this connection to the world. You'll see an 8-pin footprint here. That's for a 555 timer and the associated components. 
if you've watched my CPU build for the standalone, you know, 400 CPU, you saw me calibrate this. This position produces the baud rate for a potential ACIA that can sit in this socket location here. Uh, as you can see, this, the position's empty. You may have noticed these little strap wires. Let me comment on this quick. It's just a hole down. It's just a piece of wire that is through a couple of random holes and it's wrapped together on the back just to provide a little bit of hold down on these wires so they don't fly out every place. I may at some point take some epoxy and epoxy these down. I just haven't done it yet. But that's not really a signal wire in any kind. It's just a, a you know, it's holding the, this set of wires down. Uh, we, of course, aren't using the ACIA. We, I believe it's most likely bit banging serial data inside of the you know the tim chip via software i think this is just two bits of an io port uh there's a couple socket positions here that could have been 1702 e proms if you look at the video for my standalone 400 board or, or the other 400 bar the board that uses the acia there's a 1702 e prom sitting here and there's actually a couple of diodes that are used here and let me explain what these two resistors do in that configuration when chip enable goes low for the 1702, I think it goes low, it basically uh, makes the effective resistance here 22K, and that takes one phase of the two-phase clock and doubles the length of it, effectively slowing the processor down by 33%, someplace in there. And that was done because the 1702's age, they can get slower. And so it gave the 1702 time to get solid data on the bus before the processor tried to read it. I believe this mod actually comes from one of the app notes uh, for, uh, you know, you know, from OSI for the board. Uh, like I said, in this case, I just hooked them directly together rather than put the diode in here. So the effective resistance is 11K. Uh, there are eight pull-up resistors here. We didn't actually comment on these to pull the data bus high. You can see the data bus on the back side of the board here and the, and the vias that go through to uh, you know, connect to that data bus. These, you know, like I say, th these are eight four four point seven k. I think they're four point seven k. Looks like orange, purple, red. Four point seven k pull ups, and of course those come down to the two drivers here as well. They can put that data out on the bus or or not. Um, anything else I really want to comment on here? Uh, I've added a paper tag on both of these that indicate where pin one is. That actually does line up on pin one, it's distortion in the photo. And that's because I've got the levers on the, the ZIF sockets to the bottom rather than the up. And that's because this lever doesn't fit with the switch there very well. Most of the time I see the lever and I assume that pin one is right here. And so you might be tempted to put these two ICs in upside down. And that's why I labeled pin one. It's just a reminder that in this case, pin one is really up here and don't put them in wrong. Uh, I have once connected up VSS and VCC swapped. I didn't actually power the power supply up. I double checked, realized it was wrong and swapped them. I may end up putting a diode here that would be for biased in that condition and a fuse coming in so that it would basically the diode would clamp, the fuse would blow and it would keep power, you know, full five volts from getting into the system and powering up the too expensive chip here backwards being I'm assuming these are MOS chips I don't know if they're CMOS and MOS or MOS but it's possible with several chips in those families if you reverse the power supply leads the chip will clamp on like an SCR basically in short and it'll destroy the chip uh, it tends to tell, blow bond wires out like little fuses or may actually cause damage on the die itself so you definitely want to avoid that uh, other comments here before we get into the live demo. Uh, you may see this heavy wire here that's bringing plus five down for these guys. It just it required a jumper up above. There's some jumpers here that have to do with power railing as well. Uh, you can put a 6512 in this socket, like I say here. It is nearly pin compatible with the 6501. There's a couple of pins up here that aren't compatible, but in my configuration, they're just floating. Uh, and that's what I did all the testing with. I did the testing with the 6512 in here. If I blew it up, I can get a replacement. If I blow up the 6501, good luck. We saw two of them sell on eBay for about $5,000 a piece. If I lose the processor, the project just ends. Uh, 
looking over the board one more time. Anything else to explain here? I guess the last thing is these jumper wires like these and these two up here and this one here. Uh, those are normal configuration jumpers. If you get into the OSI 400 CPU documentation from OSI, it talks about how to configure the board. For a 6502 or for a 6501 6800 and you could have a 6800 monitor running here. You can have a 6502 monitor here, which also works with the 6501. So you can have a Motorola chip on the board here. But as the manual says, if you put a 6800 Motorola processor in here, beyond the monitor it's up to you to figure out how to build the rest of the system out because osi was really focused on the 6502 uh, processor uh, this may be the only osi 400 cpu board in the world configured this way configured for 6501 and being driven from a tim chip uh, kind of hope it is it would make it extra special if it's not i'd love to see another example of this uh, and chat with somebody who's built one you know similar to this Anyhow, let's wrap this one up. I can ramble on, and we will shift over in the video to looking at the live demonstration of the TIM monitor. Uh, so to demo the 6501 and TIM, I've got several screens up here, and I'll talk first through what these all are. This is a TerraTerm session here, and if you look at the serial port, it's set to the 300 baud 8N1 that I discussed before, and this is connected up to uh, the you know, uh, OSI 400 CPU board itself. We have a command shell down here that will become more important in a minute with a few files in it. You could ignore the fact that the pass has Apple One TASM 6502. Uh, that's a folder structure I was compiling code for the Apple One in. And I just added a folder and I've got a couple different assembly files here that we will compile and send to the TIM. We have the terminal interface manager documentation over here, or terminal interface monitor documentation up here, the original MOS documentation. Uh, Somebody rewrote this document, uh, I think Rockwell did, uh, is a company and there's typos in it. They made mistakes. Uh, it is what it is. So we'll use the original one. And finally, there's a notepad session here that has the source code we're going to compile uh, and how I'm getting it into the TIM documented. So let's start with the terminal interface monitor manual. It's from March 1976. It's the second edition. You know, back to the original place, long gone. There's an introduction, configuration, the TIM commands, interrupt and breakpoint section, monitor calls and special locations. We'll look closer at that. Uh, memory usage, the checkout process, uh, etc. So it just gets in here, but it's for the MOS 65XX processor. So that's the 02, the 01, the 12, etc., etc. All those variants it's supplied as a read-only ROM as part of the 6530-004 multifunction chip. It's really a riot chip. It's non-volatile. It's always there available because it's mass-programmed ROM inside of the 6530. Uh, deals with interrupt types, etc. Uh, via serial, it's what communicates via serial full duplex port using ASCII codes. Now I'm going to adjust to the speed of the user's terminal. As I discussed before, from TerraTerm, I can only get a 300 baud to connect. 110 won't connect. Uh, the terminal, you know, if our terminal is a long carriage return, like a teletype might, there's actually a setting to uh, create a delay in TIM to deal with things like that. Okay, you know, we can directly start a program, look at memory addresses, set memory addresses, etc. You know, it's a it's it's a small but pretty functional. Uh, Monitor programs can be punched in either two formats, hexadecimal or BNPF, which is used for programming read-only memories. Ah, that's what that is. So we will look at both of these formats uh, as we do the demonstration here. I didn't know what that second format was for. It does automatic uh, read after write verification. Got a bunch of subroutines you can call. Like I said, we'll look a little closer at those. Gets into a system configuration, which we basically have. It resides in the 653004. The 6502 is the controlling processor. It's executing code from the ROM contained in the 6530. We are basically emulating a VT terminal here, although we can use a TTY. You know, EI8 interfaces include this TT terminal emulation. Uh, gets into this configuration here. We have a 6501 here. We have 1K of RAM, so it's page 0, 1, 2, and 3. We have the TIM itself. 
and we have a, a like I said, a, you know, TerraTerm emulating a VT terminal. There's a little schematic here of a suggested build. It's a little bit similar to what I've built, but it's not the same. Uh, you know, it includes a debounced uh, reset switch. Uh, I think I mentioned before my reset switch isn't debounced. It's just a, you know, it's a single pull, single throw switch, and it does bounce at times and cause problems. I just reset again and I'm fine. Uh, goes into the Tim commands here. So the first command is a carriage return, sets the line speed. And so what happens is I'm going to apply power over here to the Tim. Power's been applied. I'm going to press a reset. And now I'll hit enter on the keyboard. And we'll see Tim output this line, which is normal. So this is a dump of address and registers, uh, the program counter, the P, the A, and it was it the X, Y, and S registers are all dumped here. We can see you know, the value coming out of those registers this is what happens after a first reset, and the period here is our prompt. Our command again, well, uppercase R, will dump that same uh, set of instructions. If I reset here and hit a random character, well, do I really want to do this? No, I'm going to hit enter. I can hit a random character, and Tim will try to adjust baud rate thinking that random character is a carriage return and things get really messed up. We get garbage coming out of the serial port. I've had it put the VT terminal emulation in weird modes uh, and I'd really rather not get into a weird mode. So anyhow, you know, here we are from a reset. We've looked at the R command. We'll, we'll come to the G command. Let's go ahead and look at memory addresses 0, 0100. It'll dump 8 bytes. The 8 bytes at uh, 0, 0100 and it's just random stuff that's in memory. This is dumped in hex. Uh, we can use a colon at this point to make changes. So what we've done here with the M command is we've said address is 0, 0100. Colon says let's go ahead and modify memory. So colon echoes back at address 0, 0100. And we can put new bytes into memory. And this is doing a full verification that those actually got set. I can do M again, 0, 0100, and we'll see that I've entered those values. M0108 will get us to the next 8 bytes. And I can use colon to change those. And we'll go 8899AABBCCDDEEFF. And again, I can do an M0100, and we'll see the first 8 I put in, and M0108, the next 8 we put in. So at this point, we can do a couple of things. We can do a. Right, it's the W command. We can do a write as hex 0100 through 010F. And we can dump out in hexadecimal format those bytes. And we can see here the 001122 all the way up to EEFF. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. I was going to try to increase the font here. Uh, well, let me go ahead. I'm going to do that while I'm thinking about it here. Font. Let's bump the font up. Well, it's already up to 14 points, so. But we can see it did a standard hex dump. There's a 16-bit checksum for the line at the end of the file. There's some preamble. There's the address uh, that it gets loaded into. So, you know, it's a pretty standard hex format. We can also do a write byte 0100, 0100F. And this is that format they talked about that's for uh, uh, device programmers. So I'd never encountered this format before in my mind. It's dumping four bytes per line. There's a B and an F that begin and, and end. I don't know what the F actually stands for. N's are zeros. P's in here are ones. So there's zero, zero. There's one, one. There's two, two. So it's the same representation. So uh, we've looked at the M command. We've looked at the colon command. We've looked at a couple of commands for dumping memory. You can set a breakpoint in Tim, but the way you set a breakpoint is you actually put a break opcode at the instruction you want the break to happen at. And Tim will save the stack, etc., and then on the next go, it'll continue from there on. So it is a breakpoint, but you've got to set, use the break command, basically, you know, the break opcode to do it. Uh, NMI, you know, interrupts, NMI, etc., can be processed, handled. Uh, there are a number of 
entry points in the TIM monitor that can be used by a user. Some of, well, they're all called out here. Uh, you can type a character to the screen from the A register. You can read a character from the well, you can send a character out the serial port here. Let me say this correctly. You can read a character from the serial port. You can send a character to a line feed and delay out the serial port. You can send a space out. You can send a byte out in hexadecimal. And you can read a character from a high-speed paper tape reader. And there's some addresses in the TIM memory space that have to do with... You, you, know, you can see it over here with, with, with uh, the carriage turn line feed delay, uh, interrupt vectors, etc., and of course the address to start when you load from tape. Uh, memory usage, it kind of gets into here about... So this is a case where the retype documentation was wrong. It said 2910. It didn't say 29 base 10 like it's written here. So if read in the translated document, Tim uses the top 2910 bytes rather than the top 29 and base 10 bytes of page zero, you know, locations, da da da, etc. So it you know, gives you some indications of how Tim is using memory. Here's a 20 base 10 representation. There's some checkout procedures here. We're seeing this happen on power up. That's a good sign. Uh, we've seen that we can dump the registers. We can do some memory manipulation. You've seen me do some of it here. Uh, let's get down to this first checkout program. So in the book, there's an example program here. What it does is it dumps the character set to the screen. So it, in, this, in this example, it dumps from a hex 20, which is a space, to a hex 6C, which I don't remember what hex 6C ends up being, but I have an ASCII chart here just for that. So 6C, 6-7, six, uh, hex 6C is all the way over here. Is That makes no sense. That makes no sense at all. Uh, check for limit. That must be more like 6-0 or something. The printout here is pretty bad. Whoever translated this into the, you'll find a PDF that's all cleaned up, got a whole bunch of stuff wrong. So, but anyhow, I've taken this source. I've gone ahead and created a source file called line.asm. This is what the source looks like. I've got the Tim notes in here for the entry points and their addresses. I've got some of that function stuff in Hink, again, captured from the document. And what my version does is it sends characters 20 through 7e out the the riot serial port, the you know the bitbang serial port, and that is a space through right before delete. So this will include all the lowercase characters. If we go back to the document here, we'll see space is hex 20, and we'll see that 126 is a tilde. I'm not sending 127 because it'd be a delete. So we should see a space through tilde appear on the screen. So we've got our source code here. It's very much what was written in here. We've got our two functions. We can send a carriage turn line feed and we can write the A register. Uh, we're going to do variable storage in page zero. We're going to allocate the first byte to be storage for a variable called character. The program itself is going to start at address 0100. We have CH set. This is the entry point where it jumps subroutine carriage turn line feed up here to 728A. And if we look at 728A, it's type of carriage return set function right there. So it can use what the comments say. It's gonna send a carriage return line speed. It's gonna set the first character to a space. It's gonna store that in the character location here. That gets us, you know, uh, the initial configuration done. Then we have a loop down here where we read the character back out. We compare to a 7F, that delete. We branch if equal done. Uh, you know, the 127, uh, it, 127 decimal is 7F hex. Otherwise, we write the character out the serial port. We call it, you know, that's a call to 726C. We increment the byte that is here, and we jump to the loop. And so what this will do in the end is it'll output 7E. It'll increment it to 7F. Uh, it'll jump back to loop. It'll come back here. It'll compare it to 7F, and it'll end. So it never actually sends the delete out. So this will run through the loop, one complete loop. It hits the break here, essentially at the break point. It'll stop, return this to the monitor, and then if I tell it to go again, it'll start at this address and jump back to care set and do the same thing over. So if I compile this, build line, I have a little script called build. 
that will compile it. Let's talk about what build does. Build is just a simple, oh, I can see that we're slightly cut off the edge of the screen here. Let me pull it out a bit. Build is just simply a Windows batch file. It turns Echo off. It says for the program that I passed in up here, it was, well, I typed uh, build space line. So these four letters line. If it finds a listing file from before, it deletes the list file, it clears the screen. I'm using TASM64 with the T65 tab file for 6502s or some other switches here. And basically, from that incoming SM file, create a bin file, create a list file. Uh, with the name, in this case, with, with the name being line coming in, line.sm, line.bin, line.list. Get a directory of the folder. Uh, if a list file was created, go ahead and open it up in Notepad++. So let's run that command again, build line, and what we'll see here is Notepad++ suddenly gets focus. It's saying, hey, your line.list file has been written since the last time I refreshed the screen. Do you want to refresh the screen? And I will say yes. So here is the output from the compiler. Here's where it compiled the code we wrote, the hex uh, for that, that program. And then one of the nice things that uh, uh, TASM64 does for me is it dumps this right here and basically says, here's all the bytes the program consists of. Uh, number of errors equals zero, but here's all the bytes up here in kind of an easier to see format. And what I have done is I have copied that block of text. I've pasted it in here. I've done a little bit of work here to convert it to an input format that Tim can read data from. And we'll, we'll look at this here in a second. And finally, into a single string, I can send that program to Tim via. So let's look at doing that. Uh, we go to M0100, and we can see that we've got that existing code in place. If I now do a colon command, it'll say starting at address 0100, uh, input the bytes that you want. You can hit return anytime before the eight bytes and stop. So M0100 again. I can then take this string and I can paste it in. The problem here is that pasting it in, it'll do it too fast, and Tim won't be able to kick, keep up. So I'm going to go to the serial port, and I'm going to set the transmit delay per characters to 650 milliseconds. Yes, greater than half a second. That seems to give me reliable, uh, reliable ability to copy and paste strings into Tim. So we'll go ahead and do this this way. We can see it entering the 20, the 8A. So it's entering this set of bytes, starting at address 0100, I can then also send a next line starting with a colon, and you'll see that jump to address 0108. It's inputting those bytes. Now normally you'd probably be using like a paper tape read or some other way of getting this into the system or even manually typing it. Let's get the next eight bytes in. You see it, address, it jumped to address 0110 hex. It's loading up those bytes. We'll give it the final byte here. And because we only need to input one byte, I just hit return here and it left the remaining bytes alone. So we've got the program in. Now we want to execute it. So the way to execute it is to issue the R command, which dumps the, you know, the PC and the various registers, hit a colon to change. And we're going to set the first address to 0100 and hit enter. We could also modify the registers if we needed to for the program, but I don't need to do that. The G command now should jump to address 0100 and execute our code. And there it is. It dumped a space. There was a space there on the front all the way to that tilde uh, and ended. And now it's sitting at address 0116. And if we go back to the list file, we'll see that 0116 is, is the is really, it's this right here. It is a jump back to care set. If I hit go, it will execute that line one more time. And then uh, hit the breakpoint, dump the registers, and stop. If I hit go again, it'll do the same thing. So now let's modify this a little bit. Let's go to address 0115. 
That's the address where this breakpoint is. And I'm going to write over the top of that. So I'm going to do a colon and I'm going to meet, just do a 4C0001, 4C, jump, 00, uh, 01. So in effect, that jumps directly to address 0100. No break happens. If I go back now and do a register set, and I change the starting address to 0100, and I hit a go, it should just run continuously. And it does. So we've essentially, what we've done is we've removed the break here, and we've moved the jump care set up a byte so that it's at address 115. And this will just sit in a loop like this. I've let this run for a couple of hours, and it just runs cleanly. You know, the 300 baud interface here seems to work really well. So what are the ways of getting out of here? Well, an NMI could get us out. We don't have a way to issue one. Uh, an interrupt could get us out. We don't have a way to issue one. But we can hit the reset button. And if I hit reset and enter, we're back. If we look at address now 0100, it'll dump the first part of our program. There's our 20, so I can scroll up here. There's our 20, 8A, 72A920, uh, 850085. So resetting Tim or starting Tim, there is no cold and warm start here. It's always a essentially a warm start. It doesn't clear memory. It doesn't modify memory contents. It does just enough to get Tim running, and that consumes a little bit of stack and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it goes. So there is really an example, one example of compiling some code on a PC, taking the output, converting it to a loadable format that I can send to Tim. Uh, and in this case, we can actually send this entire string at one time. Let me demo that. Why don't we do that? So uh, we're actually at M0100. I think we've still got that 650 millisecond delay in place. Ultimately, I can send this entire thing as one line, and it's just kind of slow. And we'll just let it do it. And it'll sit here, and it'll punch the bytes in for us. So it moves on to the next line here. It types in the colon in that 0108, and I need the 650 milliseconds to get enough time between the colon and this character here that it can do the work to display this. Anything less than that, it, it overwrites and makes kind of a mess, and doesn't always load memory correctly. So, this is a good demonstration of me, I'm going to manually hit enter here basically taking compiled code, getting the byte stream out, converting it to something Tim understands, getting it down to a single line. So there's another program in here called Print Binary. And I have not actually tried to run it before. It's right here. Uh, they intentionally inject a bug into this. They take you through a debug session, setting a breakpoint. At some point, looking at registers and making some decisions. And basically, there's a couple of bugs in the assembly code. And when you're done, you end up with this program with a fixed program. This is the program that I've typed in here called binary.asm. It compiles. I don't know if it's 100% correct or not. I've never run it before. And I thought we'd go ahead and run this for the first time together and just see what happens. So the idea here when this is running is I can type a character on the keyboard and it should hand me back the hex value for that key. Uh, of course, it's running you know, against a TIM monitor, so in the Riot chip and the TIM chip, we have these entry points for various functions. We've talked about there's some internal stuff that we really don't want to need to worry about, but in this source code, we need to be able to send a carriage turn line feed, so we call uh, in the TIM monitor ROM that address. We want to be able to write a byte out. We want to be able to read a byte in, and we want to send a space out. And then we do the same thing. We set the, ad the, the, the address of the compiler to zero. We create a variable called binary. We create a variable called count plus one. So this will be at address zero. This will be at address one. We then set the address space to zero 100 where the program starts. And we have some 6502 or 6501 assembly language here. If I jump in here and I do a build binary, It'll compile that. Yeah, it compiles really quick. We're on a very fast Windows 10 machine here. And we'll let it go ahead and load up, and we can see that the list file that was just created, there's no errors. It seems correct. I've taken this. Notice that it's now over three lines. I've copied it out. I've pasted it in right here. And I've done that same conversion all the way through to a single line I can send to Tim. 
to get that program into memory. So if we come back here and we do an M0100, we see those first eight bytes. A colon now will start loading an address 0100. Uh, and I want to paste that in. Did I copy this? I think I did, but let's copy it again. And let's paste that in. So 208A. 72, that looks familiar, now, now it changes, 20E9, uh, 972850, so I need to manually enter, hit an enter there to get it done, so we've got 288A72, that's uh, passing control to address 728A, 728A in the source file, we've said 728A is to send a carriage turn line feed out to the screen, so we've sent the binary for this into the system or the hex values. Let's go ahead and dump the registers. Let's set program execution to start it. Uh, me changing that A register shouldn't make a difference. Uh, it kind of did. It acted kind of funny there. Text message isn't important. Let me go back and do an M0100. Doesn't look like I broke anything. R. Uh, colon 0100 okay uh, being set to 0110 it wouldn't have worked ah, that's what it is I, I had a one key bounce here I double typed it so now we should be able to hit go oh wow uh, <laughs> I didn't expect this this doesn't look right so Capital A should be 65, 65 hex. Boy, it, it, you don't you don't do this for a while, you forget. Capital A is right here is 41 hex. It's 65 decimal, 41 hex. That certainly isn't 41 hex. I don't know what that is. That's a one. H and I? H, 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 H. That's, oh, that is 41. So H is, is a zero and I is apparently a one. So in those four bytes, <laughs> well, it dumps it in binary. What am I saying? I expect it next, it dumps it in binary. So there's a zero, one, zero, zero, or a four, zero, 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 one. So it's 41 hex. Let's go to zero. Which I believe is so. I guess I don't want to try to quote here. I think I know, but I don't. It is 60 hex. Yes, it's 60 hex. Uh, duh. So we have 0011. That is a 3. 0 hex. I am really messing things up here. 30 hex. Yes, 30 hex. I keep taking the decimal equivalent in my head and thinking it's hex. I, we, I, I haven't done this for a long time, I can tell. It's kind of scary. Actually, I'm translating the octal in my head. I was doing a lot of octal work earlier. I guess I have octal on the brain. That's why I'm so confused. 48 is a zero. Uh, where's the A? 65 decimal is an A. Okay, I'm back in sync here. So, so we should be seeing a 30 there, and we do. I don't, however, like that it's outputting H and I. So this is a bug in the code. And there is why. I need the hex value for a zero. We were just looking at that. And in hex, it is 30. So this actually should have been a 30, and this should have been 31 hex, which is the ASCII for a 1. So let's go ahead and write that and compile that. And we saw a couple of bytes here change. I saw the 31 appear there, and there should be a 30 here someplace. There's the 31. Should be an A931 and an A930. So, if we come back to Tim, so I need to reset to get back 
Tim Control, and I do a modify 0110. It's got that 48 there. We can now edit that, and we can change that 48 that we had as a wrong character to a 30 hex, and hit Enter. And now I can modify 01234560116. Modify 0116. Well, dump it. It's got that 49 that we need to change to a 31. I'm going to change this first right here to a 31 hex. And we'll hit enter. Let's dump the registers. Let's set the entry point to 0100 hex. And let's run it and see if that makes more sense. So capital A is 64 plus 1 for 65 decimal or 41 uh, hex so that makes perfect sense b will be one character larger than that i should be able to take caps lock off and if we add 32 to this we should get a lowercase a and 32 is going to be that bit right there and, oh, I was off by a bit. Sorry, that's 16. But we can see that this bit became a 1. Remember, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So it, A is 32 decimal higher than a capital A. B will have that same bit set. 0 is uh, 30 hex. 31 hex, 32 hex, 33 hex, 34 hex, 35. Or, you know, binary. I'm converting the binary output here to hex in my head. But there it is. It is dumping. It's doing what, what it should do now. And we actually fixed a bug. So that's pretty cool. So there, really in a nutshell, is an example of using the TIM monitor. Uh, you know, it's very functional for what it is. Let me hit reset and get back to the prompt here. At this point, we could do a right hex. Oops, get a, a caps lock back on. Right hex. 1, 0, 0, and this RAM through address, see this is binary.list, E, really RAM through address, EF120, so 0, 0120, let's look at that 650 millisecond delay set there, which is happening on input, but there's the entire program dumped. Uh, all the way through uh, 2F, is that correct? Should have dumped 28A72, 0001 at the end, 0001. Oh, this is checksum here. That's my, I always do that. So there's the 0001 that ends the program, 0001. And then there's a a two byte checksum here at the end. So there it is in hex. We can do a right binary 0, 0100 0, 0120. And again, I've got that, that delay still set for incoming characters. And it'll write this out in this BNPF or whatever it said the format was in the book in the manual over here. We can let that crank away. So there we are. We've looked at examples of calling functions inside of the TIM monitor. Um, you know, with both the programs we've wrote have called functions inside of it. We've looked at basic TIM commands. We've talked a bit about how checkpoint works. A checkpoint, how breakpoint works. Let me say that correctly. Uh, I really think this does wrap this one up. Uh, like and subscribe if you think the video is worth it. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you in a future video.